Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today at the Watering Hole. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about living infrastructure. And, you know, as Amy said, my background's really in watershed planning and stormwater planning. So I will be kind of having a stormwater focus on this, um, but really talking about how we should, I think we should be expanding our focus beyond just stormwater, even when we are designing stormwater infrastructure. So to go ahead and get started, I just wanted to talk very briefly about the evolution of stormwater management. And it really has changed over the last seven or eight decades where historically the work we did um, in, the, in the stormwater field was very much focused on control and flood control and reduction of damage. So think large scale dams, um, significant channelization, uh, getting water away as fast away from the population as fast as we could. Um, that continued really through the 50s, 60s, perhaps started to see some changes in the 70s, started to see some more smaller scale practices, more at say a, a site development level, but oftentimes that was still really focused on flood control and large storm management using dry detention practices. Through the 80s, we started to see a shift and a change, you know, in many ways, thanks to the Clean Water Act, where we started to think about what we call non-point source pollution and reducing, reducing pollution associated with stormwater runoff, uh, managing what we would call the first flush, which would have been anywhere, could have been anywhere from the first half inch to first inch of rainfall, and providing wet detention for that to allow pollutants to settle out. Moving on into the 90s, we started to really tweak the technology a little bit using best management practices. So things like, again, stormwater ponds, stormwater wetlands, bioretention cells, swales, to really try to treat stormwater runoff either through detention or infiltration or filtration. At that time, we also started to think about the use of things like low impact development and better site design to integrate stormwater management into, into our, the areas where we live and play and work and to think about how site design itself could have an impact on stormwater runoff and stormwater management. Moving on into the 2000s, we saw changes in our water quality treatment, more stringent requirements, higher volumes, thinking about how we could reduce channel erosion in streams and seeing, starting to see more of a focus on, on infiltration of stormwater runoff and recharge. And then more recently, we've really started to focus on things like green infrastructure, environmental site design, and runoff reduction. Again, a continue, you know, continuing pattern of trying to do a better job of integrating our stormwater infrastructure into our built environment. So talking a little bit more specifically about green infrastructure, sorry, this is taking a minute to switch. Um, so, so really green infrastructure um, is, pretty com common and widespread in many parts of the country as a way that we manage stormwater runoff. And there's actually a definition of green infrastructure in the Clean Water Act. And I think that maybe about 15 years ago, US EPA really started to make a big push um, of, with the use of green infrastructure um, to, to manage stormwater runoff, to do things like infiltrate evapotranspire -trans and reduce runoff. And I think this has been a huge advancement in the field of stormwater management. And I really appreciate this, but I do think we've seen some impediments and challenges as green infrastructure, the idea of it has turned into reality in our stormwater world, where, um, and that is in regards to how it's been implemented and regulated by many local stormwater programs. So the idea of green infrastructure is to use larger scale or smaller scale green, green practices and take, ben, make, uh, take advantage of ecosystem services to, to manage stormwater runoff. But I think what we've seen in many parts of the country is this has evolved into very prescriptive requirements because stormwater has to be regulated. So very specific re uh, prescriptive requirements that oftentimes um, identify specific technologies with set design requirements. Um, and that has, as a result, I think really narrowed the toolbox of the technologies and the approaches that we're using when we use green infrastructure for stormwater management. And in many cases, it has really driven us to very small scale on-site practices. And I think in, in some places, the larger scale practices that we were using through say the 1990s have kind of gotten a bad reputation, things like constructed wetlands and, and ponds. Um, and really, let's face it, what's also happened is green infrastructure is being designed by engineers and by stormwater engineers. 
and not always by multidisciplinary teams. And I think that we've just become, in many cases, so focused on fine tuning the infrastructure itself that we often forget about the larger site context and the overall goals that we're trying to achieve and what could be achieved by using green infrastructure. So what Biohabitats has done and certainly many other firm, design firms and local governments is really try to look to transition from this very prescriptive approach to green infrastructure into what I like to think of as living infrastructure which would re really requires a regenerative design approach. We're thinking that the design paradigm, which is a design paradigm where human activities are deeply integrated with living systems, continuously building biological diversity, resilience, and community. So I think the point being is not just about the stormwater goals. It's about the larger goals and objectives for a site and how, and how they can fit together. And really I see stormwater is just a single design component of that, where it's no longer the main focus, but it is one of the many things that we're looking at as we're looking to restore, repair our land, restore and repair our landscapes. And I think another really critical thing with um, specifically thinking about stormwater is back to that point of scales, where like I said, I think that in many cases, larger scale practices have kind of developed a bad reputation, which is unfortunate, but I do think we need to be thinking about looking at a variety of scales and opportunities to integrate stormwater management into our overall landscapes. Everything from harvesting and intercepting rainwater to thinking about multifunctional landscapes and conveyances that can both treat and filter and convey, but can also act as community amenities. Um, larger scale practices like green parks and public spaces, outfall treatment, and even riparian corridor treatment can all fit into the stormwater treatment box. So I wanted to run through and highlight just a few case studies of some projects that my colleagues and I have been involved in where we have really tried to take this more, more of a regenerative design approach um, to ecological restoration, stormwater management, and creating community spaces. So the first one actually is when we did about, probably about 10 or 12 years ago. It's in South Euclid, Ohio. Um, it's a retrofit of an existing detention basin, which captured, this is a, a flood control detention basin that captured several square miles of drainage for flood control purposes. And there was a need to do some work on the dam, the embankment and the riser structure. So the city of South Euclid, who was our client, obtained some, a green infrastructure grant and funding source to retrofit this basin. And we um, had, had the opportunity to work with them on this, where this basin, again, pretty typical of what you would have seen developed in kind of the, to be developed in the mid 20th century, uh, dry basin, concrete pilot channel, um, fairly, ugly fenced off scar in the landscape in the middle of a, of, a, of a fairly urban community. And what was developed was a plan to re that really focused on restoring the space, um, first and foremost, secondarily to provide stormwater treatment. So here's an example of a concept for the site that included five different planting zones ranging from open water to, to forest and meadow spaces. And this site was, was constructed in 2010. So here is an image, one of the images from before construction, immediately following construction, about two years after construction, and this was in the last couple of years. So we really have seen the site regenerate itself. And it's actually become quite a popular spot in the community where it's used by many classes for water quality monitoring and photography classes. The wildlife in that area has increased significantly. It's become really significant habitat in the area. And there is even a coffee shop and tea house that opened adjacent that has a patio overlooking, overlooking the site. So it really has become much more of a community amenity. Second site I wanted to talk about is uh, shifting gears a little bit. So the, last, the first site was a retrofit. The second site is a master plan that we um, had the opportunity to work on. We were a sub and worked with Sasaki Associates, the landscape architecture firm. And our client was the Buffalo Urban Development Corporation. So this site in the image shown on the right is a brownfield site. It was formerly the site of a steel mill, about a 360 acre site. And Buffalo Urban Development Corporation looked to the team to develop a master plan for redeveloping the site. Again, it was a brownfield site. Um, it has been cleaned up. So the con contamination has largely been contained. There certainly were site, our site constraints associated with that but they were looking to redevelop it. So 
again, we had the good fortune of re really working with Sasaki and the rest of the team to think about from the beginning, um, how can ecology and our ecological goal goals drive the master planning process? So as part of the design team, we were really let out of the gate pretty early on and took the approach where evaluating the site, we first developed a restoration plan for the site. Even knowing that our goal wasn't to restore the site, it was to develop it, we wanted to develop the context of understanding what was potential at the site itself, um, taking into account the larger landscape around. So the site's on the Buffalo River, just about a mile in, that's probably about half a mile in from Lake Erie. Um, there are some, some site constraints, including where you see in the middle a uh, containment zone, which was essentially the landfill on the site where there's very little opportunity to, to do anything. So we looked at the site and developed several strategies for restoration, including a grassland around that containment zone, areas where marsh would be appropriate, where upland forest would be appropriate, and where riparian forest would be appropriate along the Buffalo River along with shoreline restoration. But again, recognizing that we couldn't restore the site, that we were looking to develop the site, we scaled back and identified the areas that were most critical for ecological function of the site in the future, which included maintaining a, maintaining a grassland for um, songbird and migratory bird habitat, um, both upland forest, riparian forest, and river restoration, and really looking to integrate tree canopy and urban ecology throughout the site. So working, again, closely with the team and, and our client, a master plan for development was developed that took into account a greenway plan for with shoreline restoration, reforestation, and trails and access for the adjacent residential community to gain access to the site and have direct access to the Buffalo River. Um, an, urban, an urban ecology plan for the site, which included the riparian forest, the upland forested areas, which would also provide a bit of a buffer between the new development and the existing the existing development, as well as the grassland, as well as urban canopy throughout. And then finally, the stormwater component, which would really be integrated throughout the site and look at, look at capturing runoff, intercepting runoff, reusing runoff, and conveying filtered and treated runoff directly into the Buffalo River as opposed to the combined sewer system. So overall, I think one of the things that we really appreciated about this was that the ecology and stormwater considerations set the framework early on for the overall master planning process and allowed for, through the master plan, um, an opportunity for residents and users to have con um, continuous public access to the Buffalo River. Um, we were able to treat all stormwater runoff on the site and avoid discharges to the combined system. The site plan would reduce heat island effects enhance the quality of the riparian corridor in the Buffalo River, uh, provide habitat, and connect with adjacent areas, including the Tips Nature Preserve, which was immediately south of the site, um, and then clean air and generate soils and really just kind of create a healthy, vibrant, resilient place that could be used by, be used by many. And then the third site I wanted to talk about was the Peter Dominici uh, Courthouse in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You know, one of, oftentimes one of a common, like, common I get when I do work in different parts of the country, I live in Baltimore, is that, well, that may work in the Mid-Atlantic or that may work in Maryland, but it's not going to work here. And my response is, is usually twofold. First, my response is going to be, well, you're right. What we do there isn't going to work there because we need, to, we need the context of place and of climate and of rainfall and of soil. So things are going to be different. But just because things are different doesn't mean that green infrastructure isn't possible or living infrastructure or regenerative design isn't possible everywhere. It's really about tailoring it to, to the locale. So an example in Albuquerque, which of course is a very different climate than what we see in, in the Cleveland area or in Buffalo. This was a landscape renovation. It was a sustainable sites um, initiative pilot project. Biohabitats was a sub to Rios Clemente, and we were the engineer and designed the water systems on the site. And actually my colleague, Erin, who you'll see again in a few minutes, was the engineer of record for the site. So she can answer any questions you might have about it. But the site really had a lot of pavement, and it had a lot of turf grass, that were, and the turf grass required a lot of irrigation. Um, so there was runoff and waste of water. In addition, this plaza was on top of a parking garage, and there was so much irrigation required that it caused it caused issues and challenges with the waterproofing of the garage. 
So again, working with Rios Clemente um, for the General Services Administration, the team looked to modify the site and regenerate the site. Again, a lot of impervious areas surrounding the courthouse and just a lot of heat islands. So a plan was developed to regenerate this landscape um, with several different goals, including managing stormwater on the site, um, protecting and enhancing on-site water quality, reducing potable use of uh, use of potable water for irrigation by collecting stormwater runoff, um, preserving and restoring plant biomass on the site, reusing salvage materials, and restoring soils. And this really was a blend of water and urban ecology. So, um, you know, again, we looked to xeriscape the site, restore the soils, um, and create habitat as well as treat stormwater runoff, reuse stormwater runoff, and really create a more engaging landscape for people to enjoy. So just another before photo, again, of the, of the courtyard with a lot of impervious cover and turf. And after, and this is immediately after the planting where a lot of the impervious cover was, impervious cover was removed, um, as was the water feature and rain gardens were, were installed to, to treat and filter stormwater runoff and um, did, installed rainwater harvesting systems, reduced, reduced irrigation demands, um, and reduced imperviousness throughout. A lot of the existing concrete on the site was actually repurposed, was cut, and used to build, uh, provide seating and to build walls and to help and to provide, um, help build, build the walls for the rain garden terraces that place the concrete. Rainwater cisterns were installed to feed the irrigation system. The concrete was removed from the sidewalk to allow for healthier street trees, as well as increased infiltration of stormwater. And the parking lot runoff was intercepted and directed to the bioretention cells. So this is two years after installation. And then seven years after installation, the landscape really is thriving and, and functioning as, as was intended when the team designed it. So with that, I will stop talking and start to take any questions. But just a reminder, the idea of, of you know, really thinking about transitioning our green infrastructure approach for stormwater management to more of a living infrastructure approach um, by using regenerative design. So with that, we can go ahead and open it up for any questions. Thanks, Jen. And, uh, this is Erin, again, your co-host. And the way to enter questions, if you haven't caught on to that yet, is to use the, um, the dashboard that you've got there and you can type in your questions and we will kind of quarterback those and get them over to Jen. So if you wanna start putting those in there, we've got about the next 20 to 25 minutes um, available to, to run through and, and continue the discussion. So, um, Jen, that was great. Thank you. Really good overview Thanks, of some of the some of the potential. And um, one of the questions, which is probably one we always get <laughs> with living in green infrastructure strategies, is about cost. And mm -hmm. um, this one was in really uh, related to the first the first project that you showed, the Nine Mile Creek retrofit in Ohio. And there, Heather Nix is wondering if you could provide cost estimates for the detention retrofit or for that that retrofit. I don't know if we know that. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't recall the cost. That was again, that was about ten years ago. I don't know the cost off the top of my head, but it's certainly something we could share after, and maybe I could even um, plug that into the slide um, before we send out the the resources to the attendees. So I think we can follow up with that information. But yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what that cost was. In general, Jen, do you have a sense yeah. of what I think is interesting about what you're presenting is that it's you're not just investing in a stormwater BMP. You're also investing in site ecology, restoration, and and landscape. Um, do you have a sense of how um, folks should consider or look at what those costs might be, or a way of thinking about that? Yeah, that's good. It's, it's really tough. You know, it's interesting. I've actually, I think I've seen two different studies come out in the last week where one said green infrastructure is more expensive than traditional infrastructure and the other said what said the opposite. 
Um, so, I, you know, I think a few ways to think about it is if you're thinking, if you're, if you're talking about the use for stormwater management, we already have to provide infrastructure. Um, we already have to provide landscaping. Um, so really, oftentimes, an inc incremental increase in cost um, to provide green stormwater infrastructure. Um, and depending on the environment, highly urban environments, certainly the cost tends to be a little bit higher. Um, but, but that is the case with all infrastructure in highly urban environments. I think in areas where we have a little bit more space or connection to natural areas, where we re really start to see a cost benefit or reduction in cost is, is to take, is, is to really think about a more multidisciplinary approach um, that isn't as reliant on structured engineering systems to provide the treatment. So this is where we really see in some of the work we do, the blend of restoration with stormwater management, where we're using, working with scientists and restoration ecologists to really understand treatment systems in the natural world, and we're applying those to stormwater treatment um, and breaking away from um, this mindset that our stormwater treatment we've got we still have to be so structured. I, I feel like I'm just talking around in circles with in response to that question, but I, I think thinking more about it from a more natural treatment approach really starts to help bring down the cost. I think where we see things be really expensive is where we still have, um, where we're using pervious pavement or where we're using concrete curbs and, and essentially aren't truly creating a living system. We're just creating a different type of gray infrastructure. That was a long There's rambling a response. Th no, that's great, Jen, because there was actually a comment from Esteban that just to follow up on that, that he said, that multi-purpose approach is a great message. Stormwater habitat recreation and all those kinds of goals ultimately may save money or not, but they create a lot more value. And I think that is the, the key right. piece of what I was hearing hearing you say is that there's a cost piece, but there's certainly a value added element to, to right. this approach. Yeah. And I think, yeah, sorry, one other yeah, and one other point along those lines. And I think I first um, you know, heard this philosophy philosophy espoused by someone at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District in Cleveland, where we're, we're spending a lot of money on infrastructure. Um, we should take every opportunity we have to not bury it and think about the different benefits that it can provide to the community and create create infrastructure that is multifunctional and is, and is a benefit. And that was you know, what they were doing with um, some of their efforts in their combined system to, to use green infrastructure. They were really looking at larger systems that could provide a community benefit as opposed to very small scale you know, tree plant tree boxes and and street planters and, and things like that but really the idea of you don't you're, they're just don't bury the infrastructure money use it um where people and and provide a benefit to to the to people to enjoy it i think that's a good um lead-in actually jen to one of the other questions that came from jack leonard um and he's asking Along those lines, um, is, you know, how can you apply these approaches at a smaller urban scale? And are there minimum site sizes necessary in order to implement a comprehensive approach to addressing both stormwater and urban ecology? And I'll just say, just reflecting on that one as an engineer, this we get this a lot. The, the intention is so strong and people are so interested in doing the right thing. And sometimes scale or or location does seem to limit the potential. So how how would you answer that? Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think I don't think there's like a cutoff where you know it's not going to work anymore because it's so site dependent. It depends on the use of the site. It depends on the imperviousness of the site. It depends on the soil. I mean, soil characteristics are you know are significant are a significant part of this. And so I, I think it's really about in more urban environments, really doing the best you can. And really thinking outside the box in terms of looking at every surface, looking at every opportunity to to intercept rainwater, to reuse rainwater, to temporarily store rainwater on site if you have to, and to create multifunctional landscapes that um, can treat stormwater runoff, but then also provide other um, services or purposes as well. So I don't think it's a, it's a straight cutoff. I, I mean, I have no, you know, I don't. I do acknowledge that, yeah, in highly urban areas, yeah, we're not going to be able to treat always 100%. 
using just green infrastructure, we might have to look at different approaches as well. But it is very site specific as to what you can do. This is a, an interesting question here. Um, and Marianne, I don't know how to say your last name. Pia Santini, perhaps? Okay. And she's, she's wondering, Jen, how do you, how did you get people to buy in to such efforts as this? Um, and she says that we try to promote nature-based projects, but most engineers believe that they don't work. Uh, we need the science behind the project to convince engineers and others to undertake them. It's, I mean, you're yeah, talking to two I, engineers here, yeah. so. <laughs> yes, we're, yeah. Aaron and I are both engineers. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, it was the engineer on Riverbend, Aaron was the, was, was the, was the engineer on, on the Albuquerque project. Um, it is possible, I think it's education. I mean, it, it is, it, it can be an uphill battle, I think, um, at times, but I think it's really just education and, and demonstrating that you, ha you have sound science and engineering principles still behind what we're proposing and we, th we can make it work. It may just not look like, um, you know, obviously our traditional infrastructure. So I think a big one is um, in the engineering community is, is continued education of engineers and integrating um, ecologists, soil scientists, landscape architects, environmental scientists into the design process that it is a multidisciplinary design process. Um, another thing I will say is, is, is a huge impediment that I alluded to at the beginning are um, codes and ordinances that really drive um, and dictate how stormwater has to be designed and sized for a site. And so we've done a lot of work with many communities that have, have others to try to revisit those codes and ordinances to remove those impediments because those, in, those codes and ordinances create impediments that lengthen the review process, lengthen the design process, make it much more challenging to get things improved, that, that increases the cost. And that right there is a big um, disincentive for, for, for many times for project owners to, um, to, to move forward with this. So I think another thing we do is we try to work very closely with the regulators and, and from early on and, them and get them on board with what we're doing. So I think it's just, it's communication and it's education is what it comes down to and a multidisciplinary approach. An example. Yeah. <laughs> that it does work. Preferably somewhere in the, in the, in the same region as, as where you are. Yeah, that, I think that is, is helpful. And I, I certainly there's um, that education piece and uh, kind of piggybacking on that, there are a handful of questions that have come in, Jen. Um, that are related to that, which are um, about maintenance. And that's a common refrain, right, that the systems may not work and or they create such a maintenance burden um, that they are challenging to, to implement or to, to have communities take ownership over or the cost of, you know, maintaining these things. So um, some of the specific questions related to that. Um, so if, uh, Charlie Weber is asking, could you talk about how some of your work has negotiated the challenges of new maintenance strategies required of this kind of green infrastructure. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really a tough one. Um, maintenance, especially, I think, I, I, I think, you know, the, I think the, the challenges and the cost of maintenance increases um, kind of the smaller you get with the, with the practices. So really the smaller on-site practices are more challenging because there's so many of them. I mean, some jurisdictions we work with have thousands and thousands of these practices in the ground. Um, so I think one thing that we have done and that I've seen some jurisdictions we've worked with have done is uh, work basically, so this we've done this with, with like things like rain gardens, bioretention practices, um, swales, um, linear practices where you kind of design the system and then you have an optional palette of, of landscaping for the system that the property owner can decide on which one that they like and take ownership of. So you have anywhere from a very, you know, very, very simple, maybe it's just a street tree, um, maybe it's just a grass covering, um, very simple landscaping that um, then perhaps the property owner is willing to take ownership of and, and perhaps, you know, range from there up to, to more sophisticated or, um, or, com or a complex landscaping system. But really, I think letting um, the the owner of of the of the, or the adjacent neighbor take some ownership in the decision process as to what the aesthetic is going to be, I think helps 
to increase the likelihood of maintenance down the road. Um, so that's in the case where we're assuming that the property owner or a neighbor would be taking on maintenance responsibilities. Um, you know, in other cases in Maryland, what we see a lot is that a lot of jurisdictions take on responsibility for maintenance of most systems and perhaps really small systems. They actually really small scale systems that are on perhaps residential lots that'll require instead like self-reporting, like taking a photo every year and reporting it, um, submitting it to the jurisdiction for review. So I think it's, you know, just a couple of options. You know, I think one is really um, working early on during the design process to get the property owner or the adjacent owners um, to take ownership of, of, of that and a, and a willingness. Um, I think we've also started to see an increase in green jobs programs and green jobs um, development. And this is also something we're certainly seeing in the mid-Atlantic where there are training programs in place for at-risk youth to learn how to do this maintenance. And then, and then they're oftentimes being hired to, to do this maintenance, perhaps to, to supplement their education. Um, that's another thing we, we've seen is trying to ease the burden, I think, of maintenance. Um, yeah, I have another example that just slipped away from me, but I know just a few kind of random thoughts related to that question. It went off on a tangent a little bit, so I apologize. No, that's great. You actually touched on another question, which Charlie Weber had okay. asked. <laughs> if we find ourselves involved in those job trainings um, or writing maintenance strategies, and is that something that um, communities should be considering? I think so. I think, that, and I think there's a lot of resources out there, existing resources. I, you know, I think there's, um, you know, I think one, I think they should. One example is um, in Howard County, Maryland, a group called EcoWorks is really progressing the idea of, I think, advancing the idea of what can be done through either a volunteer workforce or a green jobs program to not only do maintenance of, of practices, but also to implement some very, you know, perhaps simpler restoration strategies in terms of stabilizing stream banks or, or reforestation and, and, and tree planting. So I definitely think it is something that um, local entities should look into and perhaps even a coalition of jurisdictions um, should, should look at as, as, as an opportunity. We've got a couple of questions that are um, <clears throat> a little more engineer focused, Jen, if you're game for for mm -hmm. that. Um, okay. <laughs> so, and I'm going to just kind of group a few of them and you can take them. Um, so there's a question about what tools or, or software do we use to evaluate the actual stormwater credit in terms of treatment and volume of these multidimensional systems, right? Uh, multi-dimensional treatment trains. Um, is it, are we largely doing that to justify regulators or also ourselves and, deal, and making sure that we're dealing with the runoff adequately within that bigger system? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and building on that, because this question came in, I think maybe around one of the Nine Mile Creek question is, you know, how do you manage vectors like mosquitoes within the design? Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that for those two for now. Okay. So in terms, I'll, I'll start for, 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 with the first question um, with, with regarding the kind of the tools and, and the modeling. And again, maybe this is something we could follow up with some, with some resources. You know, in many cases, um, there is, we're, we're using tools that are required by regulation to use. Um, so there could be existing spreadsheets demonstrating compliance or, you know, most stormwater manuals, uh, be they state or local, have very specific design guidelines, including cal calculation approaches that you have to use to demonstrate that what you're proposing works. Um, you know, I think we will often, you know, sometimes a lot of the systems we, we design are pretty complex and are kind of interwoven with restoration strategies. So I think we use different types of modeling, but honestly, I'm not the modeler. So I'd have to punt that question to one of my colleagues who probably isn't on here. Maybe we could follow up with some resources. Um, in terms of things like mosquito control, um, yeah, that's also certainly a common concern that we hear from, from, from people. You know, what we try to do 
design natural systems that um, have perhaps predators in them for mosquitoes. So if you're thinking larger scale wetlands or, or ponds, um, that would deal with that. Um, we deal, we often will try to design, if they're smaller scale systems, systems that infiltrate or drain within a certain period so that you don't have standing stagnant water there, um, where there could be larvae um, over the course of several days. Um, and then I had one other thought on that. But I think it's really about avoiding, in smaller systems, avoiding stagnant water in larger systems, creating a more natural system that um, ha would have predators. And, and, and the reality is if you're in say a riparian corridor and there's natural wetlands there, you're probably going to already have some of um, mosquitoes or other you know, kind of pests or nuisance pests. Um, so I think, yeah, it really, it really depends on the specific environment that you're in for that. Great. And you know, these open systems, are, are different, mm -hmm. right? They have their unique challenges. They are more alive. And so there's two questions um, that have come in that are interrelated here from Esteban Biondi and Aaron Copeland around um, the performance of these open systems or which systems are even most appropriate, for example, for flood mitigation um, for both small and bigger storms. And, and Esteban's part, part of that question is a good one too, is like, is there any long-term performance um, evidence um, that shows how, you know, because these systems can change over time, they evolve, um, that is, is there, there's any loss of like that flood control benefit, uh, for example, in these living systems? Um, in terms of long, I'm not aware of any long-term studies. Um, I mean, there's, there's certainly long-term performance studies out there. I, any that specifically focus on loss of flood control benefit, I'm not aware of. Again, that might be something that we could follow back up on in, in the resources. I think, you know, what we see, you know, what, what we've seen in some systems and some regenerative design, system, design systems we've done in the mid-Atlantic is you as the system kind of settles down after the first few years after construction, we're often seeing an increased benefit in terms of increased infiltration. Um, think of, you know, as, as vegetation grows, as, as, as roots increase, um, we'll start to see an increase, increase in that, and as well as an increase in um, pollutant processing as the systems mature, um, you know, a few years after construction. Um, but I, we can follow up specifically on flood control. I'm not aware of any related to that. You mentioned regenerative stormwater conveyance, Jen, and um, mm -hmm. is, is this one of the systems that would be implemented for flood mitigation for small and bigger storms, or, or would there be a different practice that would potentially be applicable in that case? So regenerative, regenerative stormwater conveyance systems are really more conveyance focused than they are, say, detention or retention focused, um, where we've seen really a proliferation of, of, the, of, of these systems in the mid-Atlantic is um, in stream valleys where you would have had stormwater outfalls discharging, say, at the edge of a riparian corridor, um, allowing the water, the discharged water, to flow at a high velocity down, down a hill, down a slope into a stream and causes pretty significant gully erosion. Um, so in gullies that you know can be 10, 20, 25, 40 feet deep um, and, and really causing an issue with a significant, so creating a significant source of sediment, not only to the local stream, but eventually to the Chesapeake Bay. So we've seen really a lot of these of these regenerative stormwater conveyance systems where instead of, of going into these gullies and trying to stabilize them with riprap or putting in some type of a pipe to carry water down directly to the stream, the approach is to actually go in and fill these gullies back up with, um, with, with sand and with soils and with compost and, and biochar and put in essentially like a step pool conveyance system that captures the water at the outfall and carries it down this step pool conveyance system down to the receiving water. Um, so within the step pools, which is this is this is really kind of an this is really you know a, a inspired by how streams um, how, how stream how streams function with um, with the, the pool systems and streams. So within the pools, 
you know, water is temporarily stored there and can infiltrate down into that new substrate that has been put in place and, and recharge the groundwater and flow down to the stream and re provide recharge in drier months for the streams. But then also these systems can, can safely then convey those, those higher flows to the stream as well in a more natural approach versus, um, again, a pipe system or using riprap. Um, so we really, I think that the design of those systems in particular has, has matured pretty significantly in the mid-Atlantic. And I, I, I would think there's probably hundreds of them, honestly, that have been implemented over the last 20 years or so and have demonstrated to, to really be successful. I just wanted to follow up with one comment that regenerative storm water conveyance, and this is to Aaron's, Aaron Copeland's question, can reduce peak discharge on large streams uh, through the routing. They can also reduce the number of runoff events, especially the high frequency small ones. So there's that answer. But thank Thanks, you. Jeff. We got to most of the questions. Didn't quite get to everybody's, but thank you again.